Our first speaker today is uh, Professor Emeritus Dr. Uh, Norman Fenton. Please welcome. For those of you who have commented on the colour of my suit, I bought it yesterday, I'm colourblind, and I, 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 I actually thought it was a neutral grey colour, so anyway. So, some, so some of you may know that I spent much of the last three years showing that the entire mainstream COVID narrative was driven by easily manipulated statistics based on flawed definitions, data and modelling. In particular, equating a COVID case with a positive PCR test result everywhere in the world must go down as one of the biggest but also cleverest scams ever devised. Yeah. Yeah. So, COVID was never as lethal as claimed, the testing was never accurate, and the vaccines are neither safe nor effective as claimed. And of course, for simply providing the data and analyses which demonstrate these truths, I was called a conspiracy theorist and a rabid misinformation spreader. And my previous career, in which I was considered to be a leading expert in probabilistic risk assessment with seven books and over 300 peer-reviewed papers, counted for nothing. All my and my research group's papers on this subject were essentially censored and I was treated like an academic pariah. Now the thing is, why am I telling you this now in this session? Because the same type of data manipulation and flawed modelling have been used for many years to exaggerate the climate crisis and the impact of humans on it. I claim no expertise in climate science. I do have some relevant insights into the academic and media enterprise around this to know that the claims of imminent and inevitable catastrophe is also an enormous scam. And that's because in 2015, I was chosen by a national publicly funded broadcaster, you can guess who that is, to present a documentary about the mathematics of climate change, along with two other mathematicians who have gone on to become extremely high profile science presenters for that broadcaster. In contrast, my TV career started and ended with that documentary. <laughs> which, although it, which, although, it, although it won many awards, was fundamentally flawed. Working on it revealed to me how biased and corrupt the climate change industry is and how compromised the academics are. After it went out, I made a formal complaint about the way the programme was edited, and I was especially motivated to complain about the way the text that had been scripted for me by one of the so-called academic consultants, I was concerned about what I had to say, and I had actually challenged that person during the filming to, to say, is this, is this really OK? Because I was uncomfortable with it. And he assured me it absolutely was. It turns out that after the programme went out, one of the main claims that I had stated, it turns out that in his own recent paper, recent research paper, he contradicted it himself. It was clearly not the case. So I decided, I phoned him up to, and to challenge on, on, the, on this. And what do you think his response was? We all have to lie for the greater good. <laughs> Even worse, when I recounted this story to other academics, instead of being horrified, most were in total support of what the professor had said. And one of the few who wasn't, very em eminent um, statistician, who was genuinely well qualified to know how the statistical models were flawed, told me that they couldn't go public on it as it would ruin their prestigious career. Now, what has been very effective then is the mass censorship of dissenting voices who raise concerns about both the climate narrative and the COVID narrative. And the same censorship is being used to shut down evidence about how unnecessary and devastating the net zero 2050 target will be for normal people. Now, because of much of the research that I was doing pre-COVID about risk assessment for chronic health conditions was relevant to the COVID conversation, initially I was invited to speak on a number of panels because I hadn't yet been challenging the narrative in a way which they considered to be dangerous. And on one of these panels, shortly after the lockdowns began in, 2000, in the spring of 2020, I was with three other academics from different disciplines to talk about the likely impact of the pandemic. And there's a bit of irony here. 
Because when COVID skeptics talk about the World Economic Forum and the Great Reset, we're called conspiracy theorists. But actually, the first time I heard about the Great Reset and that exact expression, along with the Build Back Better, and in particular, the exact phrase used by Klaus Schwab and all, of, all the other WF people, that this is the opportunity for a Great Reset, was on that panel by those other academics. They all said the same thing. They were genuinely excited about the lockdowns because they saw them as a way to save the world from climate catastrophe. And these academics, all progressive liberals, they should have seen this as the attack on civil liberties, freedom of speech and movement, and the massive transfer of wealth from the lower and middle classes to the upper rich and multinational corporations. They became the flag bearers for the very institutions that they previously claimed to hate while applying the jackboot to the working classes that they previously claimed to defend. And it was clear to me at that point, straight away, that the COVID lockdowns were always going to be a precursor for the inevitable climate lockdowns, which are happening in an increasingly subtle way. And for saying that, of course, I was called a massive conspiracy theorist, but as you can see in their own words, I said that before all of these reports came out. They're saying exactly what I was saying and called a conspiracy theorist for saying it. They certainly never hid that agenda. The plans were in plain sight. Now, all of the Western governments are committed by law, of course, to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. But even if you think this ludicrous objective is required, the problem is that we don't have the technology for either the large-scale carbon uh, capture and removal or for the non-fossil fuel mass transportation systems and manufacturing to achieve that. And that means, realistically, if you want to get to net zero, you have to go for something called absolute zero, which is exactly what this major UK government-funded consortium of climate and energy scientists from Oxford, Cambridge, Imperial, etc., came up with, this so-called UK FIRES project. Now, interestingly, their plan was published well over two years ago. In fact, I knew about it then and actually tweeted about it. But nobody was interested. It was actually presented in the House of Lords, but it didn't get much attention until actually, curiously, I don't know why, I tweeted about it a few weeks ago, highlighting some of the key components of the plan, and then suddenly there was an enormous amount of interest. So the key components of the plan are that most airports in the UK to close by 2030, no air travel or shipping at all by 2050, no new petrol diesel cars by 2030, road use restricted to 60% of today's level by 2050, and food, heating, and energy restricted to 60% of today's level by 2050. Beef and lamb to be phased out by 2050. So apart from the extreme limitations on personal freedom and travel, it also means either a miserable, colder, hungrier population or massive depopulation. It's one of the two. So I want to end with an anecdote that sums up much of what I've said. After I presented the climate change documentary, it was assumed that I was one of the clan. And I got invited to a few of their meetings, particularly some of the academic meetings. At one of these meetings, a scientist presented comprehensive evidence that a warming of 1.5 degrees centigrade would have a very positive effect on the population of people in the northern hemisphere. And that's because far more elderly people die of cold than from heat. And in the UK alone, the evidence, very convincing evidence was presented that that would mean net thousands of elderly lives were estimated to be saved annually. And I was both surprised and comforted to hear this at such a meeting until I heard what the speaker said next. The speaker then said that obviously this is a message which we must never promote publicly as it would compromise the movement. Thank you very much. Thank you.